Today I'm going to present what uh, some colleagues of mine two weeks ago at SLE called the most German research method, which is to be spazieren gehen, basically. <laughs> but it's not as simple that, as that, but it's as beneficial as spazieren gehen, for example. So, I'm, so jokes aside, what I'm going to talk to you about is like how one can document a language while, while being on the move, and that makes a lot of sense for the communities I'm working with. Um, but I'm sure there's something in it, hopefully, to, for all of us. But before I do this, I'd just like to really um, acknowledge the collaboration friendship with the Doe and the NADEP, who um, stand me for the last 10 years, institutions in Brazil, and of course, my colleagues and funders. So I would bet that all of us have read that sentence somewhere, right? which is a document, uh, one of the de definitions of language documentation, namely uh, the creation of, uh, creation of a lasting multi-purpose record of a language, right? So this is what we should do. And this includes records, right? We are asked to create a, a variety of records um, that span over several registers, right? Social and local variation and so on. Um, ideally, it serves lots of users, mainly, right? The communities and, um, you know, us researchers, our linguists, uh, linguists and um, colleagues from other fields. And finally, also the users, right? But um, while I completely agree that this is absolutely necessary and timely and so on. Like if we really look at our work, it's really hard to keep up with all of these with all of these things. Right? And what I see is what actually unfortunately always is lacking actually is the use of these data for community members and so on and so forth. Right. And the question is, we can probably talk a whole day about um, who is at fault here? Is it the funding agencies? Is it, uh, is, it, uh, is it academic pressures or whatnot? But this doesn't take us anywhere because we can't really change it. But what we can change is actually looking maybe at our methodologies and revising them and coming up with some ideas that make it actually maybe a little bit easier to attend to these standards. And um, if we take here Maria Methun's quote, she really shares with us, right, okay, um, uh, depend our research method actually shape what kind of material we get and sometimes we have to be uh, okay with the results may not always be the way we have been thinking of and I don't see this actually as a negative thing I see this as something positive and so I would like to not ask the, it's not really a question it's like more of a suggestion like what if we maximize the potential of a specific research methodology while keeping an open mind on the potential outcomes because this is exactly how I came up with with the results that I'm going to present today. So what I'm going to do is I would like to provide an account on how we can shape a record that actually speaks to some interesting theoretical concerns, documentary necess necessities, and what I think is the most interesting part is actually speaks to the elusive aspects of language and culture that are kind of hard to grasp, that are kind of hard to grasp. Um, I also hope to share a way in which we can attend to these standards in a more organic way while not completely being tired after field work. And I do this by presenting um, some examples of my work in Northwestern Amazonia. So we're gonna go uh, over to some back, uh, we already skipped the background. We are gonna look at uh, on the move documentation and finally reevaluate this method. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, I work in Northwestern Brazil, in the Northwestern Brazilian Amazon with Nada Hoop speakers. I mainly focus uh, on Do and Adept communities. You can see we have a very, small number of speakers. While the language, languages are luckily fairly vital, they are at risk for several reasons. Um, interestingly, and this is also how this method kind of arose naturally, all of these groups are traditionally mobile groups, meaning they maintain a high degree of mobility. Despite being settled, mobility is really uh, a big thing still in the communities, and it's also the place where what the do especially say it's like their place of well-being, right? Being on the move is something where people feel the best. Um, how do we do this? Um, it's easier than we might think nowadays with nice technology that we have. We basically use an action camera and a wireless mic and put it on people's chests or heads, depending on what you want to look at, and you go for a walk. The good thing, uh, the good thing about this is, you know, these cameras have an integrated GPS track, um, a GPS device, so we can track actually where we walk, and this is time aligned with video and audio that we see. And that makes it really easy when we then transcribe it to import the geodata as a tier in Elan. And it really helps us to actually see what do people do and say exactly where and when. So that's a really uh, easy way actually to map basically any category that you want to map. So 
let's look at what to document. Um, with respect to linguistic practices, um, of course, uh, the spatial domain comes, comes up, right? It's a really an interesting way of looking at several um, features uh, on how languages express the space. Just to give you a short example here, this is a discussion that I had with those speakers on two different motion verbs, who and do, one means to go down, to descend and want to go, descend towards a body of water. And I was sure that we are doing actually dope to go towards a body of water and that they will no. correct me, of course. <laughs> and of course they were right because I could then extract the data and can actually see, yeah, they were right. Here's a little bump in the terrain. So actually we were doing hu and then dope going towards a body of water. And if you still don't believe it, you have actually this really nice gesture that comes along with it. So meaning we can look at the very interesting semantic um, um, patterns here that we find in though that's unexpected by semantic theory. Speaking of gesture, there's many, many interesting things that we can look at. For example, what kind of gestures do people actually use on the move or when do people stop and use a certain gesture? So those are things we don't know a whole lot about. Also, this is interesting for people who are interested in conversational analysis, like starting, stopping behavior, and so forth. Specialist registers, as for example, my colleague Patty Epps and Danilo Hamos worked on path incantation. So those are um, songs that are only performed while being on the move. But then, um, so I just put that separate. I, I totally believe that these things are, of course, integrated, as uh, we saw in Bernard's talk, but I just put them separately to really convince you that we can serve several purposes. But believe they are, of course, integrated. So, for example, think about ethnobotanical knowledge, which is important for dictionaries and educational materials. And this is really um, incredible, as we can just walk through the forest and people just keep naming naming things. So things that we cannot achieve actually in free listing activities, right? They end really quickly. Just to give you an example. <laughs> And it's really nice because when we look at these videos afterwards with, with uh, community members, it is really incredible because the things they see in the surroundings that we can use to add to the, our dictionary entries, right? Not only the thing that he just mentioned about the plant, but just what we can see. Where is this plant growing? It's growing next to which plant is just a really, if, let's say, an efficient way of capturing these sort of data. Another thing is really uh, incredible is traditional ecological knowledge. So we actually come across things that you don't even think of and that community members also don't think of. And I would like to give you another nice example. Just Pay attention to the bird sound. The video is not as good as normal. It's so this is a really nice way. So what, what he was telling us here is actually that every animal kind of has like a guard, very common in Amazonia, but this sparked the interest of the whole community. So there are now a few people who, who are doing their Magisterio Indigena and actually took this as a, like a topic for their final paper, like to really research what animal guards whom and what. Um, and the last point I would like to mention, and I think this is super interesting and something I think that's kind of entering the language documentation world, which is documenting transient material culture. So that means it's a term from archaeology, basically documenting all the things that we don't, that are ephemeral, right? That we don't really see, that we're not really aware of, that we just take and just throw away. And this is also a method to document this, right? As you can see here, for example, he's tying up this tortoise. Here in a bit, he will notice no, that's not the right one. And they actually have a conversation about it and takes another kind of vine. And then we have a conversation about this and documented two names of wine that, vine that we didn't have in our dictionaries before. Or for example, we have a whole collection now of certain knots that people do and they of course all have names and that's interesting to linguists and interesting to the communities. How am I on time? <laughs> What? <laughs>
Oh, I was waiting for you. <laughs> All right. So I get, uh, then I have, might have to skip a few things. That's, that's on you. <laughs> it's on Zach. Okay. Okay. Um, right. So what are, that sounds really nice, but of course there are things that are difficult about this and some of them you, you might have already seen. Um, it's pretty sensitive data, as you can imagine. These people really forget about these cameras and start to talk about things that they don't want on video. So we have to be really careful with what we do with, with these videos afterwards. And you can it also happen to me very often that I'm just have been like at the wrong place at the wrong time, like just here. We were going on a walk. If I have food. And he sees no, these hog footprints and gets really uh, nervous about this. Tomat. Tomat. Turn this thing off and he gets really angry at me afterwards. He explained to me, no, I don't want this because, you know, I cannot have four eyes on the, on the hawk. So that can happen. We have a large amount of data to process and to process and curate these cameras, even in the lowest setting, just create huge videos and this is a problem for archives as we know also geodata, geodata is a little bit difficult to archive it's not all, all archives who accept that file type um, they're tr tricky to transcribe as you have seen it's just people are moving and you can get a little dizzy while you do this and um, incomplete footage in the sense of like you have seen right oftentimes you know the, the hands are cut off or part of the head so it's not what we learn in in language documentation classes but i think we can still discover other things, right? And it can be physically exhausting. But on the bright side, on the bright side, <laughs> I think from a linguistic perspective, again, it, I think it's an incredible way of context for contextualized grammars and, and lexicons. Um, and it's just an all encompassing spatial backdrop for many, many research questions, if you're interested in, in, in that. It also really strengthens, I think, the bond uh, between the community and a researcher. Like I have never, you know, had somebody say, oh, I remember that day when we elicited that person marking paradigm. But we had, we had, I have people saying, remembering this moment. So, you know, it's kind of, ah, you know, Karo, you remember the day when you almost died in the forest? You know, this is just, it's a very sweet memory, but I think it does something over, <laughs> it does something over time. Um, that's, that's that fish oh, that they called me. It's the ugliest fish according to the dough. So. <laughs> so, and then, of course, when you look at synergies, I think it really helps us to present or represent indigenous knowledge systems in more accurate ways, especially if we think about all the things that are invisible and transient. And this is actually something that the Doe are very proud of. And currently, at least in the Upper Hill Negro region, really a marker of indigenous identity, kind of like I know this about my culture. I, I have a phone and I wear shorts, but I know this. And I've noticed that this has been super positive, um, that kind of documentation. Of course, obviously, it responds to the immediate need uh, to work on territory and territorial knowledge. And finally, and this is, I think, is reminded me a little bit uh, of Bernard's uh, talk. I think it is just a really engaging way and mimics, to some extent, how the uh, how knowledge transfer, you know, happens more generally in these communities. Just to give you another sweet example, the last one, I promise. Um, don't focus on him, focus on the kid that will enter to the left and just follow along his head movements and you can really see how that works. How
and now he approved the article. Mm. Basically, um, I will finish. I do, I, I'm, I'm out of time, right? So, so I will. I will end this here just to say that it's, these walks have been incredible because kids just join in, and you know they come closer to the things that they're interested in and are automatically part of of that process. And I think that's a very nice way. So, fig, figure um, finishing up. I think it is a multi-purpose. Uh, it is uh, a true multi-purpose record, as we, I think, really attend to the records and add another one, the GPS one. In terms of registers, it's incredible because we can actually gather multiple re multiple re rec uh, registers on one go. Um, in terms of usage, it's kind of endless what you can do with mapping. There's, you know, uh, lots of things we can do with it, and that, of course, I think corresponds to the needs of the users. Sorry for being over time, but it's Zach's fault. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Carol. Um, mm. I missed your talk at SLE uh, two weeks ago, so I'm happy that I was able to catch it now. It occurs to me that this is the type of documentation that could easily be done without the linguist or the researcher being present in the community. Um, so I think that another plus, another advantage of this um, methodology is that it doesn't necessarily require the, the engagement or the active presence of the researcher. Has any of that happened uh, without you being there? Yeah. yeah. So uh, this last person we saw, Nelson, he is he loves doing this. And he asked me to leave uh, a camera there because he always says, you know, we're always going to these places, but we never know when we go. So it's hard for us to take you. So I now left this camera with them. So I can tell you next year what happened. But yeah, they and they really enjoy that. Uh -huh. hmm. I was wondering when they do these explanations, like they talk about this, what was it, a snake bird? Uh -huh. And they talk about the leaf and the plant who they are i mean they're, are they explaining this to each other but they're or they're, are they talking they're talking to you right they're talking to me so if mm -hmm. two of them would be all so this is my what i'm wondering like what utilizes them suddenly explaining something because there is between them is common ground right so they know what the plant is called they know that it's the snake thing they know that this is the thing so they are talking to you they're explaining it to you so once you're not there do they do this with children to teach the children, for example? Then it would be like, but like what, what makes them suddenly talk about things they know and they know that everyone else in the group knows other than you. Yeah. So this is one of the paradoxons that we have in documentation or you have in documentation when you do this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. So what I've observed, like, you know, I've done these walks with where I'm just at the end and then people walk, I don't know, 100 meters ahead of me and I don't really hear what they are talking talking about and you can really see people constantly point things out they will not explain right they will say snake uh. bird this this they will not elaborate but then still you can use that afterwards and ask and i can yeah. ask about it yeah. in these walks it's kind of i would call it like a semi-structured interview like i they know that i'm after things and yeah. yeah i think but you saw it with uh, with the snake bird actually right because you just said Snake bird. Exactly. Snake bird. And then I, I kept asking. So That's they what I was, because I thought he was snake bird and snake. And I'm like, what is he pointing at? What is he saying? And then, so he did that the whole time. So that's why I was wondering about uh -huh. this practice of they're pointing to each other to warn each other that there's an animal that could attack them or a plant that they could use or, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's the, so I'm interested, what I'm interested in is in the, in the linguistic practice that is behind it. Of like in a conversation, you talk, I talk, you talk, I talk an hour. So when they do these bushwalks, they point out to each other. What do they point out? What do they point out? And then when you ask and elaborate, so it's a really interesting genre to see, also to explore what the practice behind it is. Yeah. Because it's... I don't know how this is done, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so. We have a question here from the chat. So Amanda Delgado is asking if you can mention again uh, the brand of the GoPro camera that you are using. Uh -huh. That's a GoPro Hero 11. <laughs> and she should buy them now because the next ones will not have the GPS, the inbuilt GPS. So buy them quickly, <laughs> buy them up. <laughs> Other questions or comments? 
I would just end with, I'll make two comments then at the end. <laughs> One just following up on something Mandana was saying about um, in the, the Kakinte community that I have worked in, I feel like I have also observed this sort of adult reminder memory device of just pointing things out even to people who you know mm -hmm. already know such things. Um, yeah. So that was also cool to see. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is just that um, you framed the use of the camera and these walks as documenting a way of learning. Mm -hmm. um, I think it also probably valorizes that way of learning um, and shows people that it's important um, to do this. And you know, we're not back in some classroom trying to teach this out of a book. Um, you can learn it just as you have always learned it. Exactly, and that's interesting as the though, especially the Nadip um, into creating a differentiated school curricul curriculum is actually something they are integrating and saying, yeah, this is how we learn. We don't learn sitting, right? And so that kind of just, I think, gives them just some some how do you call that some oh, backup to 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 do it the way they they think it's right yeah, yeah this, reminds, oh, sorry. this reminds me of an event in uh, papua new guinea uh, so there was a man who studied had studied forestry in the 70s mm -hmm. and uh, then he was interested in our documentation and but he said now Ulrike, you stay here at the coast, you know, give me your camera, I do the photographs, yeah, and then the others can describe them, yeah, because he said, no, you can't walk through the mountains, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Carol. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.